Hey everyone, Professor Davis here, and we're going to be looking at cell structure and function today. Now, as we get into talking about cells, one thing we need to look at is called microscopy. This is because cells are very small in their size. Even though they may vary where some cells are smaller than others, we do see that a microscope is needed to see most types of cells. Now, electron microscopes can be used to see cells in more detail and even to look at the small structures inside cells called like organelles, but light microscopes are mostly what we end up using. There are a few cells, if you look here, that can be seen with the human eye. These are things like the human egg and frog eggs. They can be seen with the human eye. Now, these are known as microns when we're looking at this small measurements that these particular organisms have. And so if we look at them, they're one micrometer, which means they're one millionth of a meter. So they're very small. Now, when we're talking about microscopes, the big thing about them is they do magnify things. They make them larger. So magnification is increasing in size. But it's important that our microscope also lets us see detail. If we can magnify it, but it's all pixely like you see in this picture, then there's no point in making it bigger because you can't see any of the details. So we want to make sure that the microscope also has what we call resolving power, which gives us clarity of an image. So the higher the magnification that we have means we need a higher level of resolving power in order to see the details that are present. So in this particular case where we zoomed in on a part of a boot, we might need to use a higher resolution to take the picture to prevent pixelation from occurring. And the same thing happens when we talk about microscopes. Now, there are three main types of microscopes that are out there. Now, there's also subtypes of each of these, but the first one is the compound light microscope, and this is the main one that you use in most labs. So if you were to take like microbiology with me, we would look at using the compound light microscope. Same thing if you were taking biology or anatomy with me in person, the compound light microscope is what you would learn to utilize. It can magnify things a thousand times bigger than what they are. On the other hand, SEMs are scanning electron microscopes. These are a lot larger microscopes and they allow you to see 3D surfaces like you can see here of this ant. They do magnify more than a compound light microscope, so they do magnify um, 100,000 times bigger. The microscope that can actually magnify the most is a transmission electron microscope. These allow, it to, allow us to look at internal structures of cells, so like those organelles like chloroplasts or mitochondria or some things we're going to talk a little later about in this particular video. But when we look at this, they can magnify up to 500,000 times the normal size of that particular um, structure. All right, now let's talk a little bit about the cell theory. When we're talking about the cell theory, this was really developed because of the development of the microscope. When we were able to start to see that structures like ourselves or plants or other organisms were made out of smaller things that they ended up calling cells. Now the first individual or scientist that contributed to the cell theory was Robert Hooke. In the 1660s, he's the one that coined the term cell to describe life's basic unit. Now he observed what we call cork cells underneath the microscope and they looked like little rooms kind of like what monks lived in or that's what they used to call cells and so he called them cells we also see two other individuals in the 1830s who contributed we have sheldon in 1838 who studied plant cells and schwann in 1839 who studied animal cells they both determined that plants and animals were made out of cells and then Virchow in 1858 told us that cells were capable of self-reproduction. We now know this is mitosis and meiosis, but this helped develop the, the three tenets of the cell theory. So the first tenet says that the cell is the basic unit of life. This means structurally and functionally. It's the basic unit of life, which means all living things are going to be made up of cells or at least one cell. And so in order to be considered living, you have to have at least one cell. And the last part of the cell theory says that new cells are going to arise only from pre-existing cells. They only come from pre-existing cells. So these are the three tenets of the cell theory. Now, cells have to remain small for a reason, and this is because they need to stay efficient in how they function. So size of the cells has to remain small in order for it to function efficiently. A large surface area to volume ratio is needed in order for it to function properly. Now, this means that small cells have more 
plasma membrane, the outer edge, compared to the cytoplasm or fluid inside of the cell. This allows the cell to be able to control what's going on better if it has a very high plasma membrane to cytoplasm ratio. So as the cell increases in size, the surface area to volume ratio starts to decrease, which means the cell is going to be less efficient. It's going to have not function as well. So a concept here, in the smaller cells, cellular communication and control is more effective than if the cell is larger. This is because the nucleus can only control so much volume. It's kind of like um, if you were put in charge of some like little kids, like kindergartners, you could only control so many compared to somebody else. Or if you had help, if you had more individuals or adults in there, you could obviously have more children in there. And so this is going to be like the nucleus. The nucleus can only control so much. Also, the plasma membrane can only regulate so much material going in and out of it. If it gets to be too large, it no longer can kind of see what comes in and what goes out and make sure that it has that regulatory uh, function. So it's really important that the cell doesn't get too large. So as an object grows larger, its volume increases more rapidly than its surface area. Okay, so the fluid inside is going to grow faster than the edges or the surface area. The surface area to volume ratio then starts to decrease. And you can see that here in this particular picture. The smaller ball has a 6 to 1 ratio, whereas the larger one has a 2 to 1 ratio. That's a lot smaller ratio. Now this is why larger organisms must be composed of many cells. This is why we are a multicellular organism. We're composed of many cells that work together instead of one large cell. Now, there are a few exceptions to this rule. Cells that specialize in absorption, they actually need to have a very large surface area. And this is like we see for the epithelial cells of your intestines, like your small intestines. A lot of those cells end up having these little villi or um, extensions that happen from their membrane, which increases the surface area. So that increases versus if I just drag across here, if I increase the surface area going between each finger, this allows for better absorption. We also see neurons are like this in order to communicate. They're large and they can then collect information from multiple areas. And then of course, chicken eggs and even any kind of bird egg is going to be a lot larger. And this is a single celled organism at first. Of course, it then develops into a multicellular organism, but it does start as a single cell. Now, we are going to look at both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells here, but let's focus more on some general characteristics that all cells have to start with. Okay, so I know it says prokaryotic cell structure here, but I want to talk about the general structures that all cells have at first. Okay, the first thing is that all cells have to have a plasma membrane. Okay, we also call this the cell membrane. And the reason they need this is that this is what acts as the barrier that separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. So it acts as a barrier. It also is going to regulate what gets to go in and out. So it regulates the nutrients in and the waste out of the cell. Another thing that all cells have inside of them is cytoplasm. This is between the membrane and where the DNA is found, whether it's the nucleus or the nucleoid. And it contains a watery, semi-solid type fluid that's in there. This substance allows for communication and movement within the cell, um, but it is that fluid inside. There's also going to be some DNA these are in the form of chromosomes. This is the genetic material. So this contains our genes, the hereditary factors of that particular organism. The DNA ultimately controls all of the cell's activities. The last one on here is the cell wall. Now, not all cells have a cell wall, and I'll talk about the exception here in a minute. But the cell wall does provide structure. It helps maintain shape and rigidity for that particular cell, and it protects the membrane. So it has a protective type of function as well. Now with the cell wall guys, cell walls are found in bacteria, plants, fungi, and some protists. So animal cells do not have a cell wall. So cells like our self, like our cells that make us up, animal cells do not contain a cell wall.
Now, in bacteria, the cell wall is made out of something called peptidoglycan. Okay, that's found for bacteria. In plants, the cell wall is made out of cellulose. We talked about this in the chemistry chapter. And then in fungi, it is made out of chitin or chitin, which was also talked about back in the chemistry chapter. So if you look at these, these are all going to be certain combinations of types of sugars. Okay, and so they do have a sugar component or carbohydrate component in these cell walls. So looking here just at a generic cell, we do see that there is the plasma membrane that separates the inside of the cell in the white versus the outside out here. We also see that it could have a cell wall. So the cell wall could go around the outside. We also have the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is between the plasma membrane and where the DNA is found. In this particular case, this DNA is found inside of a nucleus. Okay, so this is giving you an example of a generic type of cell. Now, in eukaryotic cells, the DNA is found in the nucleus, but in prokaryotic cells, their DNA is found in a general region that they call the nucleoid region. This region does not have a special membrane around it like we see with the nucleus. So let's talk about prokaryotic cells first. So when we look at prokaryotic cells, they lack a nucleus and organelles except for ribosomes. They do contain ribosomes. That's the only kind of organelle that they have. Now, when we look at the prokaryotic cells, they do com come in two different domains. The first domain is the archaea. Archaea live in more extreme environments, and we talked about this back in the introduction chapter. We also see that these are going to be the ones who like that extreme type of, of environment in the sense of maybe temperature, acid, um, lack of oxygen. There could be some sort of extreme factor that's present. And these would be things like the methanogens and the thermophils. Most bacteria or most prokaryotes are in the group bacteria. Bacteria are going to be omnipresent, meaning they're found pretty much everywhere. They're found in the water, soil, air, in you, on you. This group of bacteria, most of them are free living, meaning they are not out to hurt you. They actually help more for, as decomposers in our environment, as well as in economics, they do help us make lots of types of food. However, there are some bacteria that are disease causing, which are harmful to us. Some bacteria must live in very moist environments. These are going to be things like cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria is an autotroph, meaning it can make its own food through photosynthesis. Now, when we look at prokaryotic cells, they are going to reproduce normally asexually. This is because they are a single celled organism. So one cell, if it wants to reproduce, divides into two. It does this through what we call binary fission. And the reason it's done do this through binary fission is because it lacks a nucleus. Okay, mitosis, we're going to talk about later, but mitosis is a cell division due to the fact of having a nucleus. These guys don't, so we call it binary fission. Binary tells you it's going to be two. Fission means it breaks apart, okay? So this means I start with one parent cell. This one parent cell turns into two cells. These cells are all genetically identical. They all look exactly the same. All right, so now let's look at the general structures of just prokaryotic cells. So when we look at prokaryotic cells, they do have the plasma membrane just like any other cell. It acts as a barrier and it's that regulatory structure. They do have a cell wall. This is going to be, again, structural and it protects the membrane. And some prokaryotes, some bacteria have a capsule. The capsule is even further out from the cell wall and it's a gelatinous type structure. It protects the cell from being engulfed or eaten because a lot of these guys are going to be, especially like in us, our immune system is going to want to get rid of them and they want to Pac-Man or eat them to destroy the cell. This is going to make it harder to grab, okay, because it has this jelly-like substance on on the outside. Prokaryotic cells can also have some appendages that are present. This includes the things like the flagellum. This is a whip-like tail which moves back and forth for motility. They can also have pili, and pili are hollow tubes that help with attachment. They look like little hair-like extensions from the cell, and they help hold on to things. They act for attachment. In the cytoplasm, we find in prokaryotic cells, there's a nucleoid. The nucleoid is just a region that contains a single loop of DNA. So bacteria have one single chromosome, and it's a big loop of DNA. We also see that they will have ribosomes, and ribosomes are responsible for creating proteins, doing that protein synthesis, okay, so helping make proteins.
As we take a look at this prokaryotic cell, let's look at these different structures. So the innermost membrane that you see here in the yellow is the plasma membrane. Just out in the little darker green is going to be the cell wall. And the outermost layer that we see here in the light green is going to be the capsule, that gelatinous like structure. We also find that we have some appendages here. We have the pili, which are those little hair like extensions. And then you also have the tail here, which is the flagella, to help it swim. Inside of the cell, you do find that you have the cytoplasm, which is the liquid portion. We also have those ribosomes that look like little sprinkles inside of the cell. This pink blob that you see in here is the nucleoid. This is where the DNA is located. So this is just a basic kind of structure of a prokaryotic cell. Now, not all prokaryotic cells will have pili. Not all prokaryotic cells will have a flagella. Not all prokaryotic cells will have a capsule, okay? But they could have each of these structures. So now let's switch gears and look at the more complicated type of cell, which are the eukaryotic cells. Now with the eukaryotic cells, they are in the domain eukarya. They are eukaryotes because they contain a true nucleus. This is what the name means. Eu means true, karyo means nucleus. They also have lots of various organelles that are present. Now organelles mean tiny organs, okay? So they've got these tiny structures in there that do particular jobs, just like you have organs in your body that do particular jobs. Like your heart does a different job than your stomach. Your stomach does a different job than your kidneys. We're going to see the same thing inside of these cells. They are in the domain called eukarya, and some examples are going to be things like protists that you can see here, as well as fungi, plants, and animals. So these are the four kind of kingdoms that are located in that domain eukarya. Now these cells are about 10 times larger than most prokaryotic cells because prokaryotic cells are super tiny. These are larger cells and they are more complex. Okay, so they are a lot bigger in comparison to prokaryotic cells. Now, organelles we just talked about, these guys are going to be tiny organs or little organs. They are compartmentalized small structures that have a specific function. So they do a particular job. Organelles also have to communicate with each other in order for the cell to be successful. So this handout that you can see here is created to kind of show you how a lot of these things are related. So you have your major cellular structures like the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, or also what we call cytosol, and the organelles. You have the nucleus and all of its parts, as well as ribosomes, the endomembrane system, which are a series of membrane-bound organelles that kind of work together. We also have our energy organelles, as well as the cytoskeleton. So these kind of put the different structures into some subgroups. So if we look here with these main structures, we do see that there's a plasma membrane and the cytoplasm. Those are not drawn here, but we do have a nucleus present. With this nucleus, it does contain the DNA, which is found in the structure of chromosomes or chromatin. We also find in here there is a a dense area where RNA is made, and this is known as the nucleolus. We also see there's a membrane around the nucleus that we call the nuclear envelope. This envelope does have tiny little holes in it that we call nuclear pores. Inside of the nucleus is a fluid. That fluid is called nucleoplasm. Okay, so this is giving you an idea of those structures. We're going to talk about them in more detail in a minute. Just coming off of the membrane of that nuclear envelope, you are going to find that there is going to be something we call the rough ER. Now, the reason this is called the rough ER is that it has ribosomes present. So ribosomes studded on the ER are going to be involved in protein synthesis, and this is what makes the ER rough. There's also going to be free-floating ribosomes in the cytoplasm. Now, the rough ER and smooth ER are both going to help create different products, whether it's proteins or fats or hormones, different things like that. And it's going to send them to be packaged into vesicles. This process uses the rough ER, the smooth ER, and the Golgi. And the Golgi looks like that little stack of pancakes there in the middle. These guys are going to make, of course, vesicles. Vesicles may include things like lysosomes, but they also might be secretory vesicles that are going to secrete their products out of the cell. Okay, so these are just some examples here. 
Now again, you can see the Golgi complex located here. It's kind of like that stack of pancakes. Now, lysosomes and peroxisomes are products that can happen through this process. Lysosomes are going to be the ones who contain hydrolytic enzymes and they act as the recyclers of the cell, as well as peroxisomes are going to help detoxify things because they contain peroxide or hydrogen peroxide. The energy organelle that we see here is the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the site for cellular respiration, which we'll talk a little bit in another video, but this is where glucose gets converted into ATP. And recall from our um, chemistry chapter that ATP is the source of energy of your cells. We also have the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is made out of proteins, has multiple jobs, but we have what we call microfilaments and intermediate filaments that help give the cell shape. They also act as kind of a highway for these organelles to move across through the cell. And then there's also microtubules. These microtubules can form things like centrioles. When we look at centrioles, they are going to be important for um, mitosis, okay, cell division. We also see that they could be that these microtubules are found in the flagellum. Now there's only one cell in humans or animals that has a flagellum and that is sperm. So not very many cells in this group will have the flagellum. We may also see them in cilia. And cilia are those little extensions, hair-like extensions, and then also spindle fibers, which are important during cell division, which you cannot see in this particular picture. So let's go and break down each of these structures in a little more detail. And let's start first with the nucleus. So the nucleus is the largest organelle found in the cell. It can be seen using a compound light microscope. So just a normal light microscope, you can see there'll be a dark circle normally inside of the cell. That is the nucleus. The nucleus is also known as the control or command sender. And this is because it does contain the DNA, the hereditary information. Now this is composed of what we call DNA DNA, which recall from the chemistry chapter is a nucleic acid. Now DNA does form chromosomes. When they're condensed, they're visible. You can actually see them. They're like wound up. However, when they are not condensed and they're actually kind of free in their structure, they're going to be very thin and stringy, which you can't really see in the picture. It just looks like a dark kind of blob. So this is looking at a nucleus here. We also see the function of the DNA, remember, is to store genetic information. It also is going to dictate or control the cell's activities. Now, looking at other components that are part of the nucleus, we do see there is the nucleoplasm. This is the semi-fluid matrix that's found inside the nucleus, so it's the fluid inside the nucleus. We also have the nucleolus. Now, the nucleolus is a round body in the nucleus, and this is where ribosomes, which are made of RNA, are manufactured. It's where they're made. And to me, guys, if you look at this particular picture, it reminds me of like a jawbreaker. If you've ever seen jawbreakers when they've been broken open, they a lot of times have those layers of colors, but then there's this really dense ball in the middle of that jawbreaker. That would be the nucleolus here if we're talking about a nucleus. Also, the outer covering of the nucleus is known as the nuclear envelope. This is going to be a double layer and it does have tiny little pores in it. Those pores allow for movement of things in and out of the nucleus. Now they are small, so they're gonna only allow super small structures to move back and forth. Now this nuclear envelope is part of the endomembrane system, and this is why the rough and smooth ER is normally attached to this structure. The next one we want to look at are ribosomes. Ribosomes can be non-membrane bound organelles. They don't actually have a membrane around them. Their purpose is to make proteins. So they aid in the production of proteins or what we call protein synthesis. Now, how does this work? We first start with DNA in the nucleus and DNA cannot leave the nucleus. However, it contains the instructions. But the ribosomes are outside the nucleus and they actually make the proteins. So we've got to take that DNA and we're going to copy the information down into RNA. This RNA then can leave the nucleus and it can be read by the ribosomes. The ribosomes then help make the beginning of that protein. And you'll notice it looks like that string of pearls, which we saw back in the chemistry chapter. That's the first stage of the formation of a protein.
Now, ribosomes are composed of two subunits, the small unit, like you see in this picture, and a large unit. These ribosomes are larger in size than prokaryotic ribosomes, and they are composed primarily of RNA. Okay, so they are primarily composed of RNA. They can be found free in the cytoplasm or in chains. We call those polyribosomes where they come in chains, or they can be attached to the rough ER. Okay, so the endoplasmic reticulum is a structure. Some of it is smooth and some of it is rough. The part that is rough is studded with ribosomes. You can even say it's bedazzled with ribosomes. So guys, this is kind of what the basic structure looks like. We have DNA. We're going to copy it into RNA. RNA can leave the nucleus and go to the ribosome and a protein is created. You can also see in this picture that we have a large unit and a small unit to the ribosome. So where in the nucleus are these ribosomes made? Remember on the previous slide, they were found in the nucleolus. So the nucleolus is where these ribosomes are made or manufactured. Now this brings us to that endomembrane system. This is a series of membrane organelles that collectively are involved in transporting things. Okay, so they're gonna transport things in the cell. Endo is Greek and it means internal or within the cell. So this includes the following organelles. We have the endoplasmic reticulum. It is abbreviated as ER for short. This is going to be the smooth ER and the rough ER. We also have the Golgi complex or the Golgi apparatus. And then we have some different kinds of vesicles. Vesicles can be secretory or transport vesicles. They could also be specific vesicles like lysosomes and peroxisomes. So let's look at the endoplasmic reticulum first. This is membranous channels and network of tubules, as well as flattened sacs. So if you'll notice, it's a lot of different structures kind of put together. This membrane is an extension of the nuclear envelope. So it does connect to the nuclear envelope. Now the rough ER is the one that is studded with the ribosome. So if you kind of think of it as, I use a lot of ca candy analogies here, but if you look at those sour gummy worms, they are sour because they have that structure on the outside, that soury salt that's on the outside. That makes it rough. Whereas the smoothie are is like your regular gummy worms, which are smooth. They don't have that sugary, sour substance on the outside. So the rough ER is studded with ribosomes and it makes and transports proteins. Because remember, ribosomes make proteins. The smooth ER, on the other hand, does not have ribosomes on it, so it does not make proteins. The smooth ER is going to transport non-protein-based molecules like lipids. So they're going to help make lipids in this process or fats. So a quick little note here is that the endoplasmic reticulum or the ER membranes are going to pinch off to form these secretary vesicles. Okay, they're going to make these little pouches that contain the proteins or the fats. These are going to then get transported to the Golgi. The Golgi then is going to modify whatever the product is and get it ready to be transported elsewhere, whether it's within the cell itself or out of the cell to some other type of either cell or structure. So the Golgi apparatus looks kind of like a stack of pancakes. When the Golgi receives the different vesicles from the rough and smooth ER, it's going to then transport these after it modifies them. So it's going to modify them and get them ready for transport by repackaging them and sending them out. I like to compare the Golgi apparatus to like a UPS store. The UPS store is where I could go in and I could just take whatever in there and they say, hey, I want to I want to ship this particular item. When I take it into the UPS store, they'll take it, they will package it for me, and then they'll ship it out. This is what the Golgi will do. So when substances come to the Golgi, that'll determine what, how it needs to package it up, modify that, and then send it where it needs to go. So it acts as like the UPS store. Now, vesicles that are formed by the Golgi or even by the endoplasmic reticulum are small membranous sacs that contain something in them. Now, some specific vesicles that can be made are called lysosomes. Lysosomes contain very powerful hydrolytic enzymes. Now, hydro means water and lysis means to dissolve or to break apart. And so the lysosomes are really important because they help clean up the cell.
Lysosomes act as like the recycling center of the cell. Now, they are faulty in a disease called Tay-Sachs, where they do not clean up the cells, and so the waste products start to build up, and in the brain, this causes a major issue. It ultimately causes brain cells to die and causes brain damage. Tay-Sachs is a genetic disorder where the only problem is, is that the lysosomes are not made properly. So it creates a lot of problems. We'll talk more about Tay-Sachs when we get to the genetic um, diseases uh, video. We also see, so this is what a lysosome would look like. It contains hydrolytic enzymes inside of its double membrane. On the other hand, peroxisomes, they contain oxidative enzymes. This is to help detoxify or break down products, especially invaders who come in. And this is going to be produced during cellular, especially certain products that are being produced during cellular respiration. So these are peroxisomes. So we have lysosomes and peroxisomes. They're very similar in structure. The difference is what's packaged inside of them. Now, we also see that you can have something called vacuoles in here. Vacuoles are large membranous sacs. They're not associated with organelles or the endomembrane system. Vacuoles can have a variety of functions, and here are some examples. In the first picture over here, we have a contractile vacuole. This is for water regulation. This is like in protozoas. They will fill up this um, particular vacuole at certain times, and then they may... Um, push all of that water or fluid out and empty it out. And this could be used for movement. It could move things within the cell. There's a lot of different reasons they may have a contractile vacuole. There's also digestive vacuoles. These are also found in protozoa. And this is where they take their food in and they digest them using these little vacuole type structures. In plants, however, there's a very large central vacuole that's located. This vacuole is really important because it helps with water storage because plants really need water for photosynthesis and so their cells need that extra water. They also will store nutrients in here as well as waste products or enzymes. So it's like a storage shed for the cell. That's what the large vacuole is for. All right, the next set of organelles we wanna talk about are the energy-related organelles. These are the organelles that specialize in converting energy into a usable form for the cell. This is going to be what we call metabolism, okay? In the sense that we create this energy through transfer, through chemical transfer, to be able to use it to do work. Some of that work may be for growth, it may be for repair, and it may even be for reproduction. So ultimately, guys, all energy from planet Earth comes from the sun, okay? All energy comes from the sun. Now, only certain organisms can utilize this energy. These are known as those that can do photosynthesis. And the types of organisms that can do this have a special organelle in them called chloroplasts. Chloroplasts allow for this type of cell to absorb sunlight and convert that light along with water, and carbon dioxide into sugars and oxygen. That is what we call photosynthesis. So it's a conversion of solar energy into chemical energy. And we will talk more about this process in a, in a, in a future chapter. However, this kind of conversion of energy is important by the chloroplast because then other cells and even the cell that did the photosynthesis can do what we call cellular respiration in a different organelle called the mitochondria. The mitochondria takes that sugar that was made through photosynthesis as well as the oxygen and it produces carbon dioxide and water as well as releases that ATP to be used for energy. So this is the conversion of chemical energy into a form that the cell can actually use, which is ATP. All right, so let's take a closer look at these two energy organelles. The first one is the chloroplast. This is the site of photosynthesis, and this is only found in autotrophs, those that actually can utilize the sunlight. These have plastids that contain chlorophyll inside of them. So chlorophyll is that green pigment that absorbs the light. These are found in plants and algae. And so guys, if we look at the structure of the chloroplast, it does have a double membrane. It has these little disc-like structures that they call thylakoids. They stack together kind of like poker chips and they call that grana. The fluid inside of the chloroplast is known as stroma. So one thing to note here is that chloroplasts do have a double membrane. 
They do contain their own DNA so they can make enzymes that they need and they do synthesize their own proteins. The structures you need to remember that are found in chloroplasts are thylakoids and stroma. We also see that the mitochondria is going to be found in heterotrophs. However, mitochondria are also found in autotrophs. They're also found in plants. This is the site for cellular respiration. Mitochondria act like your electric company in your cells. They are like the, the cell energy. They are the powerhouse. And so inside here, you also see that there is a double membrane. The double membrane is not as uniform is what we saw in the chloroplasts. However, inside here, you do see it contains DNA and it does synthesize its own proteins. The structures you see here are the cristae. The cristae is the folds in that inner membrane. And then the fluid inside of the mitochondria is known as the matrix. Now guys, both of these structures, chloroplasts and mitochondria have lots of enzymes that make these reactions go really fast so that they're able to produce food and also produce ATP very quickly. Now, because of these two organelles, this brings us to a theory called the theory of endosymbiosis. Now, endo again means inside and symbiosis means they're living together. Things are living in kind of like a harmony in a sense together. So this attempts to explain the origin of eukaryotic cells from prokaryotic cells. So symbiosis is a close relationship between organisms of different species as they live together. This should suggest because chloroplasts and mitochondria have their own DNA, this suggests that the energy related organelles, chloroplasts and mitochondria were once free living prokaryotes. But what happened is, is they were engulfed or ingested by a host cell and then they started helping each other. The prokaryotic cell, like the mitochondria or chloroplasts, benefited because it got protection and better survival odds. Whereas the host cell got the benefit because it helped with energy production. So this is the theory of endosymbiosis. Supportive data for endosymbiosis from both chloroplasts and mitochondria is they do contain a double membrane that could have made them be engulfed. They do contain DNA so they can replicate on their own. They can make their own proteins because they have ribosomes inside and they are similar in size to prokaryotic cells like other bacteria. And so these are all things that again help support that idea of endosymbiosis. And so guys, on here we have two pictures. We have a close-up look of a chloroplast as well as a close-up look of a mitochondria. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is composed of proteins. Um, they compare in function to your musculoskeletal system. So when we look and break this down, the musculosystem, your muscles of your body, help you with movement. So the cytoskeleton also helps with movement within the cell. It acts kind of like a highway inside of the cell. And it can also help move the cell as a whole if need be. The skeletal part gives structure. So your skeleton gives you structure and this helps maintain the shape of the cell and provides support of the cell. So some general components, you have actin filaments. Actin are the very thin, flexible filaments and these are found a lot of times in muscles, okay, to help with the movement of muscle cells. We also have intermediate filaments. These are a little bit thicker and more rope-like in their structure. And then we have microtubules, which are the largest, but they are hollow on the inside. And remember that the microtubules are used in the flagella, the cilia, the centrioles, things like that. So microtubules give rise to flagella, which are the long whip-like projections that allow for motility or movement. Cilia are like the little hair-like projections, which also allow for movement. And centrioles, you can see here in this picture, they're located in the centrosome of animal cells, and they help organize the spindle fibers during animal cell division. And we'll talk a little more about cell division later on. Now, anytime we're talking about multicellular organisms like plants and animals, we need some sort of cell junctions in order to communicate between one cell to the next cell. So in plant cells, because they do have a cell wall, they have a special kind of cell to cell junction called plasmodesmata. These plasmodesmatas are channels that extend from one cell wall to the next. This allows water to move from one cell to the next or very small molecules to also move to neighboring cells. So this allows for sharing of water, 
nourishment, and even chemical messengers. So in plant cells, this kind of junction in between one cell to the next through the cell wall is called the plasmodesmata. Now in animal cells, there's a lot more of these junctions that can be present. These are formed by the extracellular matrix between adjacent cells or so cells next to each other. These can be formed with the cytoskeleton and also some junction proteins. There's three major types of junctions we're gonna talk about in animal cells. The first one are called anchoring junctions, also known as desmosomes. These are going to provide sturdy yet flexible sheets of cells. And the function here is to allow tissues and organs to stretch. Okay, and so these are what we would consider anchoring junctions. They kind of look like rivets in like a ship, okay, like those big rivets. They also may look like spot welds. If you've ever looked at like the bottom of a chair where the leg comes in and it's been spot welded together, that's how these kind of look as an animal junction. And these are anchoring type junctions. It's also would be like how you would stitch them together in a quilt. Like when you take a quilt and you do patchwork where it's one, one patch next to the next, when you stitch them together would be similar to these desmosomes. Now, some structures in us as humans that really rely on these types of junctions are things like your heart because this allows it to beat and be flexible and move but still makes it where it doesn't fall apart as well as your stomach which stretches when you eat and your bladder that stretches with urine. The next one we want to look at are called tight junctions. Tight junctions are when adjacent cells are like zipped together. They're very closely tied together. Um, this allows fluids to be contained so they don't leak. And so this is really big in like gastric fluid when we talk about digestive in your digestive system so that your stomach acid's not just leaking out of your stomach or also in your bladder so urine doesn't leak out. These tight junctions look like they've been zipped together. Tight junctions look like they have been zipped together. These are big in things like your stomach, your intestines, your bladder, and your kidneys. The third one we see here are called the gap junctions. The gap junctions are channels that extend between one plasma membrane of one cell to the next. This is gonna allow the neighboring cells to quickly communicate with each other. So they can actually coordinate what they're going to do. So they're the little channels or holes in between one cell to the next. Now these are important if we need really rapid communication due to the flow of like molecules or ions. And these are really big when we talk about in nerve conduction where nerves talk to each other and also the contraction of your heart and muscles. This allows for them to contract all together and so they can successfully utilize that muscle. All right, so plasma desmata are most structurally and functionally similar to what type of junctions in animal cells? Okay, so plasma desmata were little channels in between each cell through the cell wall. So which animal cell junction is similar to that? Is it anchoring junctions, tight junctions, or gap junctions? Well, if we're doing a comparison, it's the gap junctions that are most like plasma desmata. All right, so let's do a quick comparison between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So this little chart can be helpful when you're studying. So prokaryotic cells are found in the domain archaea and bacteria. There are no kingdoms in this part. In eukaryotic cells, the domain is eukarya and the kingdoms are protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. In prokaryotic cells, the DNA is a single loop. So they have one DNA molecule. It's found in the nucleoid region. Eukaryotic cells have what we call chromosomes, and they are all found in the nucleus. Prokaryotic cells do not have organelles except for ribosomes, whereas eukaryotic cells have various um, organelles, and they also have ribosomes. Prokaryotic cells are very small or simpler in their structure. Now, guys, they're not really simple. They're just simpler. And we do see eukaryotic cells are a lot larger and more complex. Prokaryotic cells, cellular organization, they are unicellular, meaning they're composed of one cell, whereas eukaryotic cells can make up multicellular organisms. So any multicellular organism is going to be made out of eukaryotic cells. 
So here's a picture that just compares prokaryotic cells to eukaryotic cells. The prokaryotic cell has very few structures compared to the eukaryotic cell. The eukaryotic cell has so many more organelles present to help it successfully function. This is also why eukaryotic cells can be larger in structure than prokaryotic cells can. All right, now let's do a comparison between plant and animal cells because there is a difference that we saw with some of these. So cell walls, are cell walls located in an animal cell? No. However, are they located in a plant cell? Yes. Remember that the cell wall functions in support and protection and in plants, this is made out of cellulose. The next thing is chloroplasts. Chloroplasts, remember, do photosynthesis. Well, who can do photosynthesis? Well, this would again be plant cells. Animal cells cannot do photosynthesis. You cannot go outside when the sun is out to eat your lunch and be like, let me just soak up some of the sun. Oh, that was such a great meal. No, you can't do that. But the plants outside are doing that every day. Okay, they are able to do it. But us as animals, we cannot. So the next one we have is a large central vacuole. Remember, this is for storage of stuff like water, nutrients, waste. Large central vacuoles are found in plant cells, but not animal cells. We also see lysosomes. Lysosomes, remember, are the digestion or cleanup crew in the cell. These are found in animal cells, but not plant cells. Centrioles are going to be associated with animal cell division. We don't know exactly what their role is, but we do know that they are important in this particular process. So they are found in animal cells, but not plant cells. Last but not least, shape. A lot of times when we draw out these or you see diagrams of these types of cells, animal cells are more round whereas plant cells are more rectangular. And they normally will make them look more rectangle, more like a rectangle because of the cell wall that's present. All right, so here's a little picture. When we look at this picture, what do you see? Is it an animal cell or a plant cell? So in A, what kind of cell is it? Well, let's look at some of the structures. If you look at A, you will notice that there are chloroplasts present. You will also see that there is a cell wall and a central vacuole. If those three things are present, that should tell you that that is a plant cell. On the other hand, if you look at B, if you look at the cell B, you'll find that there are lysosomes that are present. Okay. You will also see that there are centrioles. Okay. Or what they call a centrosome. But there is no chloroplast, no cell wall, and no central vacuole. So this is an animal cell. All right, so doing a comparison of plant cells to animal cells. So guys, one thing to remember, common organelles that are found in both in plant and animal cells do include the nucleus. Plant and animal cells both have that. They both also contain ribosomes. They have rough and smooth ER. They have Golgi and they have mitochondria. So in general, guys, as a student, when you're studying biology, you should be able to tell the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, which we talked about in this video. You should also be able to label cell structures as well as know their function. So you should practice that. You need to make sure that you know the different organelles and what they do. And also compare and contrast plant and animal cells. What do plant and animal cells have in common and what do they have that is different? So these are the things you should be able to do after you finish this video or this part of biology. All right, so if you have any questions or concerns, please don't be afraid to ask.